Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Jemanski. I'm the Purdue Extension Educator in Perry County, Indiana for Agricultural and Natural Resources. And I was invited today because I've been breeding dairy goats since 1999. So I've been in this a little while. And actually my master's work was in uh, goat and sheep nutrition, particularly in my master's work, my study was dairy goat nutrition. So we're gonna talk today about feeding dairy goats for show and production. Now, nutrition is a huge topic when we're talking about any type of livestock nutrition. And so we're not gonna be able to get very in depth today, but we'll give you an overview of some of the more important things to consider when you're feeding your dairy goats. And so we're gonna go over a few keys to having a quality dairy goat nutrition program whether you're looking at having a herd of show goats or whether you're having a herd of, of goats for commercial production or for home dairy production. But the first thing we need to consider when we're feeding dairy goats is what life stage are we feeding and where in that life stage are there? Are we feeding does? Are we feeding bucks? Are we feeding kids? Are the does in lactation? Are we feeding miniature goats like Nigerians? Or are we feeding our standard dairy breeds? You know, there are very different nutritional requirements between a Nigerian dwarf and a sonnet. But what's the frame size of our goats? You know, goats with a bigger frame size are going to have a higher caloric requirement, a higher energy requirement than goats with a smaller frame size. And so these are you know, things that we need to consider at the very start of determining our nutritional requirements for our goats. And so when it comes down to it, a, a sonnen in full lactation that's producing 16 to 18 pounds a day is going to need to eat a lot more and she's gonna need a much higher quality diet than a Nigerian dwarf you know, dry yearling will. You know, the Nigerian dwarf dry yearling will require very little in the form of energy. And you know, she'll need mostly forage diet with very little concentrate supplementation. Whereas a high producing sonnen doe or alpine doe is going to need a significant amount of concentrate supplementation to be able to support that milk production and support <clears throat> that her you know, being able to maintain her body while she's producing that much milk. And also within the different lactation, within the different stages of production, there are different nutrient requirements. So in early lactation, you're gonna have a much higher nutrient requirement than, than at pretty much any other stage. Particularly if you have a yearling, you know, a yearling milker that is in early lactation, she's still growing, she's still putting on bone, she's still trying to maintain her body and grow and lactate. And so this is gonna be a much higher nutritional requirement than we're looking at in a doe, even in mid-lactation. In late lactations, they're starting to wind down you know, that particular lactation. And then we're looking at gestation. So early gest gestation, you know, you have requirements that are going to be more like your late lactation. Mid gestation, you're starting to have a little bit larger fetuses that they're, you know, feed, they're feeding. Late gestation, you know, it gets to be really vital. We'll go into more detail on that later in the presentation. And then again, we're considering growth. So are we feeding kids? Are we feeding yearling milkers? And the time of rut with the bucks. And so we're, the bucks are not going to want to eat as much, and they're also burning a lot more calories as they blubber along the fence line. And so a good starting point is looking at the body condition score of our goats. And so dairy goats, along with meat goats and sheep, have a scoring system that goes from one to five, where one is going to be very, very thin and five is going to be obese. And so with a good feeding program, you're actually gonna see different body condition scores at different parts of the production cycle. So we're talking about a doe. When she's in peak lactation, we're probably gonna be looking at a score somewhere between two and two and a half, if you have a high producing dairy doe. Now Nigerian dwarfs, you may not ever see a, a two or two and a half, but if you're looking at a high producing sonnen doe, a top 10 milker, or even, you know, even your 3,500, 3,000 pound, 3,500 pound producers, they're not gonna be able to maintain weight very well those first few months of lactation because they literally cannot eat enough calories to make up for all the calories that they're putting out in milk. So we're going to see the body condition score drop as they get into lactation, get into peak lactation. 
But by the time they get to the end of that lactation, when we get to breeding time, we want to get them back up to a body condition score of three. So a mid-level body condition score, not too fat, not too thin. And then early in gestation, that 2.5 to 3 is healthy. You know, with this chart, you know, a lot of these numbers were developed for meat goats and sheep. With dairy goats, we probably want to keep that 3, right at that 3. And then late gestation, stay in that 3. And then at kidding time, with the dairy dough, I'd actually say 3.5 to maybe even 4, simply depending on what you're kidding. But now once you get above 4, then you get into problems with pregnancy toxemia, ketosis, and so you don't want to be above a four at kidding. And so pretty much you want them to always be between a two and a four, depending on the production stage, how much they're producing, and what you're doing with the animals. Now, a doe with a body condition score of two is probably not going to perform very well in the show ring in most cases, unless you just have a really super high producer and it's evident that she's putting it all in the bucket. Judges will, you know, say, you know, they'll understand that body condition score of two and a half or, you know, somewhere in that range. But most of the time, a body condition score of two is going to get you back farther along the line in the ring. Once you get down to a body condition score of two, it's starting to affect the way the animal looks. You're starting to see a little bit more slope to the rump as you get to these lower body condition scores. You're, you know, you're seeing maybe not as much depth in the barrel. And so this is going to affect how she performs in the show ring. She's just not going to have a smooth little look at a body condition score that she will at a body condition score of three or three and a half, which is kind of your show peak is what you want to see is three to three and a half for, for a show animal that performs. And so this chart was developed for meat goats and sheep, but it's fairly similar for dairy goats. To get a really good idea of what the different scores look like in dairy goats, there's a great video that was developed by ADGA and UC Davis in collaboration. And so a link to that video is posted at the end of the presentation. But I would encourage that you go watch that video. It's about 20 minutes long. But so a body condition score of one is an emaciated goat. And so at a one, you have a goat that's tucked up in the abdomen, she just does not have that internal fat. You're going to see very prominent spine. You will be able to see every bone on this goat. At a body condition score of two, you have a goat that's thin, but she can still be healthy, but you're not going to see as much muscle along the, the top line. You're going to see the ribs will still be visible. And so you have a much more prominent, you know, but just more, a lot more prominent of all the points of the goat. So maybe the points of elbows are going to be a little bit on the prominent side. And you can just tell that she's thin, but you're going to see more depth in the barrel than you will with a body condition score of one. Body condition score of three is moderate condition. And so she's going to, the muscle, the muscling will be there. You know, the point of the, <clears throat> of the spine, the spine is going to be softened because you're not going to see, you're going to have some fat cover over the, over the spine. And so you'll have some, you know, you'll just have a little bit more condition there. And then once you get into a four, then you're looking at a fat animal. So you're going to have fat cover over the back. And now all of your ruminants, all of your livestock, they gain weight from front to back. So you're going to see that fat first around the brisket, and then it's going to move back and around the shoulders. And then as they get fatter, you'll see fat farther back in the body. And then a body condition score of five is obese. You have you know, significant fat everywhere, internally, externally, and this is really not a healthy weight for your goats. You do not want to ever see your goats in a body condition score of five. I have you know, judged some 4-H shows where I did see some meat goats in a body condition score of five. They were so fat that they were literally down on their pasterns because they were carrying so much weight. This is not healthy for your goats. You don't want a body condition score of one. You do not want a body condition score of five. The other, other body condition scores you may see in healthy goats as they go through different stages of production. And so what you want to do is you want to monitor body condition score periodically. And so, you know, if you have times where things are rapidly changing, you probably want to monitor it weekly. And so if you have a small herd, you know, 20 or fewer goats, you want to put your hands on every goat every week. If you have a large dairy herd, for instance, 
pick 10 to 15% of the herd and monitor them regularly. So when we're looking at feeding, forage is the base feed stuff that we're gonna use for our goats. And so we need to match the quality of the forage to the stage they're in production wise. So if you have dry yearlings, for instance, you don't want as high quality of a forage as you're gonna use for a high producing dairy doe. So dry yearling, you might feed a, maybe a horse quality grass hay, something that's a little bit lower in protein, something that's a little lower in, in energy versus a high producing dairy dough where you're gonna to want to feed the highest quality forage that you can, that's available. And so we're going to supplement with other feed stuffs. And so we'll talk a little bit about that later to correct any deficiencies in the forage. But forage is our main forage or roughage. Yeah, so forage would be something that they're going out in the pasture eating. Roughage would be hay or other things that you're feeding to them. And so we're gonna use other feed stuffs to correct deficiencies from the forage. And so depending on the stage of the, site, the production cycle, there are a lot of different forage and roughage options that they can use. And again, it depends on, you know, what's the age of the goat? Are they you know, lactating? Are they not lactating? And so they have different needs based off of that. And so what do you want to look for if you're looking for hay or pasture for your animals? So first of all, compared to other species, Goats are going to prefer browse or broadleaf plants a lot more than they will other things. So they have a lower preference for grass. They'll eat different weeds, you know, what we call forbs that are in the, the grasses, but they actually prefer woody plants compared to cattle, horses, and sheep. And so when we think about this, think about that goats have a higher nutritional requirement per pound of body weight. They need a higher quality diet than cattle or horses or even sheep, which means they need more calories per pound of feed than a cow does. And a lot of it has to do with their smaller body size and they can't break down, th they don't have as big of a room and so they can't make up for it in volume the way a cow can. So what affects forage quality? One of the big things is the maturity stage at harvest. So if you're harvesting hay, or if you have them out on pasture, how mature are these plants that they're eating? So as plants mature, they develop lignin, and so they become less digestible. There are fewer calories per pound of hay or grass. So if you're looking at a, at a pasture that's mostly brown, that's gonna be mature grasses, you're gonna have less quality, and in general, you're going to have yeah, it's going to take a lot more of it to and meet the requirements of these goats. And goats can only eat so much. And so if you have a poor quality of an over mature hay or grass, they, may, they literally may not be able to eat enough to be able to meet their nutritional requirements. And so the other thing that affects the quality is the species that you're feeding. So legumes are typically going to have more nutrients in them than grass as well. And so you're looking at a higher quality hay or forage with it if you have legumes versus grasses. Now, a lot of times a mix of legumes and grasses can be helpful to get the right numbers because you don't wanna to feed too high of quality to an animal that doesn't need it. You wanna make sure that you match the quality to the needs of the animal. Also variety within a species. And so you might have a lower lignin species versus a higher lignin species. So lignin is an indigestible form of fiber. And so if you have something that's indigestible, you know, it's something that they can't use. Another thing to consider if you have, if they're on pasture is think about your fescues. So a low endophyte or novel endophyte tall fescue is going to be much higher quality forage than a tall fescue. So if you're grazing your animals, consider that. There are a lot of issues that can happen with your endophyte infected tall fescues, your toxic endophyte fescues. A lot of, I know cattle have a lot of hoof issues due to these fescues. Another thing is the leaf to stem ratio and the leaf retention. So particularly when we're talking about hay. 
So are you looking at a first cutting hay that has a lot of stem? That's going to have a lot of lignin in it that they can't digest. So it's going to take a lot of it to be able to get enough calories and other nutrients to meet their nutritional needs. Or say you have alfalfa and the leaf is shattered off and it's all fallen off. The stems aren't going to be very nutritious. The leaves are where the nutrients are for the most part in alfalfa. So think about how much leaf do you have to stem and how many leaves are actually in that hay. And then pests it can cause a problem. They can cause nutritional issues with hay or you know, quality issues with hay and other forages. You know, if you have blister beetle in your alfalfa, that'll cause issues. It could be insects, diseases can lower the quality of the forage, and then you know, certain weeds that are in your, your hay or forage can cause problems with your, your quality. And then also the environment. So once you get to hot weather, you start having more lignin. You know, that's going to mature your grasses and other plants faster. So a high lignin, you know, so hot weather, you know, it dries it out, it's maturing, it's developing lignin. Or think about when you're cutting your hay. Is there too much moisture when you're cutting your hay? So is it degrading in the field? Is it getting rained on in the field? You know, potentially, does it get moldy? Has it, you know, sunlight can bleach out some of the nutrients. So just kind of consider all of these different factors. And so you can't necessarily tell the quality of a forage or a hay just by looking at it. Another aspect is, has the pasture or, you know, or hay field been fertilized? It can only, these plants can only put in what they're able to take out of the soil. So if you have a low fertility pasture or hay field, then you're not going to have the nutrients in the forage that you would have if it's properly fertilized. And another issue can be the presence of foreign matter. Is there broken glass? Is there a dead snake? Is there something else that's causing a problem in your hay, you know, in your hay or forage? This, and this is particularly talking about hay. So if you're, if you're mowing your hay and there is a piece of twine wrapped up in it, if there's a dead snake, if there's a dead rat, lizard, broken glass, all of these different things can get wrapped up in hay and can cause problems with the quality. It can make it you know, dangerous for the animals to eat or it can just make it less appealing to them. And so silage is something that we don't often think about feeding to goats, but it can actually be a very high quality dairy goat feed if it's properly made. So if you are going to feed silage, you want to make sure that the pH is less than 4.5. If the pH is above 4.5, then you can have problems with botulism, listeria, any number of issues. But if you have a pH of less than 4.5, then it can actually be a safe feed for goats. And it is a very high quality feed. You know, when you ensile any kind of forage, it makes it more digestible. And so it may not, you know, you're not gonna have more protein than it would originally have, but it's gonna make those fibers more digestible. And overall, it can really support lactation. And think about the storage conditions. Has your hay been stored inside or outside? If it's stored outside, you're gonna lose a lot of quality. So ideally, you wanna be able to store it in an area where it's covered, where it can stay dry. You wanna make sure that there's appropriate moisture. So it, if it, there's too much moisture, you can have molding and in general, loose quality. And so when we're looking at hay, if we're looking at forages, we want to look not at both the sensory and the chemical evaluations of the forage quality, and they complement each other. So it's really important to have both the sensory evaluation and the chemical evaluation. So sensory evaluation, you're using your five senses. Primarily, you're using sight, touch, and smell. Those are the primary senses that you're going to use for sensory evaluation of forages. What does it look like? Does it look nice and green, or does it look kind of brown and degraded? When you stick your hand in it, is there something that pricks your hand? Does it feel good? Does it feel soft? Does it feel like something they would want to put in their mouth? When you smell it, does it smell musty or moldy? So that's what we're looking at when we talk about sensory evaluation. 
you can't just use one of these. You have to use all of these senses to be able to determine whether or not this is a quality of hay that you would want to feed your animals. Does it smell like something you would want to eat yourself or not? Does it feel like something like if you stick your hand in there and you draw your hand right back out because it hurts, they're probably not going to want to eat that. And so here's a story that's told by our nutritionist or our forage specialist on campus. So a number of years ago, he was brought a sample of hay. <clears throat> and this sample, you know, it had a really nice, really high quality test. So it was, it was alfalfa hay, you know, you had, it looks like really good quality hay on the chemical analysis, but the sheep wouldn't eat the hay. And so the farmer brought it to him for analysis or for evaluation, he stuck his hand in and this is what he found. So this hay was absolutely full of thistles. And so when the sheep would eat this hay, then they would actually get you know, lacerations, they would end up with, <clears throat> with damage to their mouths from all these thistles that were in the hay. So thistle actually tests out about the same quality as alfalfa. So the nutrient values are very similar. But when you have these, you know, the, the spines, then it damages their mouth and they can have ulcerated mouths as a result. And so they're not gonna eat something that's painful. And so just because it tests really well and it looks really pretty and it smells really good doesn't mean it's something that you can feed your goats and they are going to do well on. So you, that's where that feeling that hay and checking it for thistles and other things that prickle can help in evaluating whether or not this is a good feed for your animals. And so what types of tests are required? And so we want to see, so, you know, we want to see what amount of dry matter is in this hay. So what's the actual percentage of dry versus wet? Because, you know, when it comes down to it, it's the dry matter that's going to provide the nutrients. You don't really get nutrients from the water. Water's essential, but you're not getting the nutrients. It doesn't count with calories. There are no calories in water. We're going to look at the crude protein, the adjusted crude protein. And so that tells us, you know, are animals' protein requirements being met? And, you know, again, depending on the life stage, there are different protein requirements. And then we're going to look at the fiber. So neutral detergent fiber and acid detergent fiber. So neutral detergent fiber is fiber that is, you know, soluble and it's somewhat digestible. Acid detergent fiber is not digestible at all. And then if we're looking at a silage sample, we're going to look at the pH of the sample. So these are the, the essential tests in determining the quality of a hay. Typically, it's going to cost $15 to $38, depending on how it's analyzed and what tests you request. And it's important that you get a representative sample of your batch of hay. <clears throat> you want to use a hay probe. You do not want to grab handfuls of hay because that's not going to give you a representative sample. <clears throat> So you're going to want to use, yeah, so you can use, there are a different number of different types of probes available out there. There are battery drills, electric drills, you can use a brace, or there are manual probes. And if you are interested in sampling hay, a lot of the extension offices do have a probe available in the office. So I would call your local extension office and ask them if, if they have a probe that you can use. And so they... They can be a little bit on the expensive side, but that's why we have them available in the extension office for you to use. And again, most of our extension offices have hay probes. You can also purchase your own, especially if you are producing hay yourself, then it's a good idea to purchase your own probe. And so www.foragetesting.org has a list of companies that sell hay probes. And so again, if you're testing hay that you're buying from somebody else, you could probably borrow a probe from the extension office. If you're going to be producing your own hay, you really need to buy your own probe. So how do you collect a sample? The first thing you wanna do is 
randomly selects hay bales for the same harvest. You want to probe two cores from each of 10 large bales or one core from each of 20 small rectangular bales. So when you're looking at a round bale, you want to go from the side because what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to get a sample of every layer of that bale. So if you think about how a round bale is made, it's kind of wrapped you know, from the center out. <clears throat> so you want to go in from the side of the round bale, and then you want to go in the butt end of rectangular bales. So 20 probings total, the side of a round bale or the butt of a square bale. This is going to give you a good representative sample. So the reason why you get 20 is because you may have, you'll have outliers. You'll have some samples that are way off from the average. Once you get 20 samples, then it averages out something that's going to be pretty close for that batch of hay. So you'll get a good idea of what the actual average nutritional content is of that batch of hay, average quality. And so you're going to take those corings and you're going to place them in a resealable plastic bag. You're going to label the bag and then you're going to mail it or carry it to a certified laboratory. And again, you can find certified labs at www.foragetesting.org. So this is a great resource for learning more about how to test your forage. And so here's just kind of a good, yeah, you know, short, yeah, you know, a good way to remember it. So think of stab, sample. So you're going to use a hay probe to take 20 probings from different bales of the same batch or the same cutting. Test, so T for test, send to a certified laboratory for analysis. You want to request dry matter, crude protein, insoluble crude protein, neutral detergent fiber, acid detergent fiber, and minerals. Allocate. So what you're going to do is you're going to review your test results and you're going to allocate the hay based off the needs of your livestock. And then B, balance. So you're going to provide these results to a trained nutritionist so you can get, <clears throat> get recommendations for cost-effective supplements and you're going to feed those along with the hay to meet the needs of your livestock. And so again, this is kind of the way to remember it. STAB, STAB, Sample, Test, Allocate, Balance. And so when we look at, you know, again, as we mentioned earlier, if you look at some of the different weeds, they can have very similar nutritional values to alfalfa. And so the test doesn't tell you everything. You need to know what's actually in your field, what's in your hay. So make sure that you know how to identify different weeds. So now let's look at supplementing our dairy goats. And so again, the forage provides the base of our ration. The, most, the majority of what we feed should be some kind of forage or roughage, so either hay or pasture. But dairy goats, again, they're, they're going to have much higher nutrient requirements than meat goats, particularly during lactation. Again, you're looking at a different type of frame on the animal, and you're looking at a different metabolism. And again, within, you know, within dairy goats, we have a lot of different requirements depending on the breed, depending on the stage of production. And so there are people who do successfully manage dairy goats on forage. However, you're not going to get a dairy goat in show shape on forage alone. And so most dairy goats will benefit from concentrate supplementation depending on age and stage. You know, the exception would be, you know, probably a lot of our, probably a lot of our dry yearlings would benefit from a, just forage and supplementing minerals because we see way too many overweight dry yearlings in the show ring. And so most dry yearlings probably do not need concentrate supplementation. But a lot of our other goats, though, if they're in lactation, most of them are going to need concentrate supplementation. You might have some exceptions in some of your Nigerian dwarfs or others that tend to get overweight. But lactation is extremely energy intensive. And so we need to make up for that energy that they can't get from the forage. Because forages can be a great source of other nutrients, particularly you know, protein and calcium are found in forages, but 
you know, a lot of the forages are not going to have energy like our concentrate rations are going to have. The bigger our goats, the higher maintenance requirements they have. So if you have a saunan that's 35 inches tall, she's going to have a much, much higher maintenance requirement, even before we talk about lactation, than a 22 inch Nigerian dwarf. Bucks are going to have higher maintenance requirements than weathers. So weathers, again, if you have some pet weathers that you use for carts or something else, a lot of those could be maintained on forage with a mineral supplement. But bucks are, you know, most of the time, at least going into rut, are probably going to need some kind of an energy supplementation. And it also depends on the time of year and what, what forage you have available to you. So when you're supplementing, you want to consider a few things. The weight of the feed, not the volume of the feed. Because you can have some feeds that are very lightweight, so you're not going to get, you may have, like for instance, beet pulp. Beet pulp is a great supplement. It's a great source of energy. It's highly digestible fiber. It's a great source of calcium, but it's really lightweight. And so a scoop of beet pulp is going to be a lot lighter than a, the same size scoop of corn, for instance. Also consider the weight of the animals. So most of our, you know, our dry stock, they'll probably eat about 2% of their body weight per day. Our milkers, you know, can eat anywhere from three to 6% of their body weight per day. And you take that into consideration, their actual ability to eat and the amount of calories that are in that amount that they can eat. We also want to avoid drastic ration changes. So we don't want to, you know, so if we think we need to improve the diet, don't improve it all at once. Gradually increase or you know, gradually add your you know, better quality ration into the diet. You know, gradually transition over to a higher quality hay. Gradually transition to more, you know, feeding more of a supplement. We also have to consider cost, you know, because we have to face it. You know, most people who raise dairy goats are not, you know, are not independently wealthy. You know, so we do have to consider cost when we're feeding our animals. And sometimes the, the solution to cost may be raise fewer animals. Sometimes we might, if we want to have a really nice show herd, then we can't show 30 goats. We have to show 10 or we have to show five. And so what we need to consider is the cost of our project. Is this, is it, what is our goal? Is our goal to show? Do we want to have the, the best looking animals for a show? Well, in that case, we're probably better off having fewer animals, but feeding a more expensive ration. But if our goal is to have a commercial dairy, in that case, we probably need to look at the cost of the ration. And we have a set number of goats that we need to be able to produce enough milk to be able to meet the needs of our clients. And so in that case, we're going to be looking at the cost of the ration more. And so it just kind of depends on what our goals are for our herd. There's some great resources out there for ration balancing. Langston University actually has a dairy goat ration balancing tool if you want to try to, you know, to balance your own ration. University of Maryland has some resources for sheep and goats as well. We say Langston, I believe, is the only one that has a dairy goat specific ration balancer. And so as we look at the different stages, right now we're in breeding season. And so we have some different goals during breeding season. We want to, most of the time, we want to increase the number of kids in the litter. And we, that includes the number of does that successfully settle. And so we might consider flushing. So what flushing is, is you're increasing the energy that the does are eating leading up to breeding. And so you're going to, so you want them to actually gain half a body condition score at, you know, coming up in the month or two before breeding. And so you're going from maybe a 2.5 and peak lactation up to a three, or from maybe even a three to a 3.5. I wouldn't go any higher than 3.5. I'd much rather see them at a three at breeding time. So you're better off if you let them get a little on the lean side during peak lactation and then increase that body condition score to a three at the time of breeding. Then if you do that, they're gonna have a better chance of conceiving. 
and you have a better chance of twins or triplets. And you wanna make sure that the mineral nutrition is, <clears throat> is right for those animals. And so that min those minerals could come through a balanced you know, commercial ration, or they could come from mineral supplementation. And so again, you know, when you're looking at you know, preparing to breed, you're going to want a body condition score of three to 3.5 at breeding. So you're gonna be moving from a 2.5 to three or from a three to a 3.5 in preparation for breeding. And so usually at this time of year, you're going to have them either on pasture or if you have an intensive management situation, you're gonna have them on free choice hay and you're gonna supplement as needed with your, your dairy goat ration, whether it's a custom ration that you've developed or whether it's a commercial ration. And with meat, and this, this number with a two to 2.5% of the daily intake for the supplement, that's for meat goats. You might have to feed a little bit more to dairy goats because they do have a higher metabolism. And so you want this flushing diet from two to four weeks before and two to four weeks after breeding. And so and it's also important that your mineral mix has adequate selenium for fertility. But you need to remember that selenium, that too much selenium is toxic. So you wanna make sure you have adequate selenium, but not too much selenium. And so in early to mid gestation, you don't, the fetus is not growing very quickly at this point, but the placenta is. And feeding this time of gestation is gonna influence the birth weight of your kids. So you don't want your kids to be too heavy at birth. And so you don't want to overfeed during early gestation. So what you want, so your goal during early gestation and even mid gestation, your goal is maintenance. And so if you have a commercial dairy, your does are going to still be lactating. And so at this point, I would continue feeding kind of a maintenance for lactation. They're not losing weight, they're not gaining weight. But you don't want to underfeed because you won't have enough placental growth and you could have you know, too low of a birth weight with your kids and they won't be as vigorous, but you don't want to feed too much or you could have high birth weight kids and you could have birthing problems. And so underfeeding can also increase embryonic loss. You want to make sure that they're maintaining weight, but you don't necessarily want them gaining weight at this point. And so think about, you know, what's your maintenance diet for this animal if she's dry or if she is still lactating? So you don't want to see weight loss. You want to maintain the body condition score. If they are too fat, so if you have a doe that's had a body condition score of four, she can lose you know, down to a body condition score of 3.5. If you have a young doe, if you have a yearling or two-year-old or coming yearling, coming two-year-old, you probably want to get her body condition score up a little bit because again, she's still going to be growing with she kids. And so you want to make sure that she has something to lose. So if you have a, you have a, a coming yearling or a coming two-year-old that's at a body condition score of three, I try to get her up to maybe a three and a half. Or if she's, or if you have any dough that's thin, so any, any dough that's under a three, I would try to get them up to a three. And again, you still want to feed primarily forage and supplement it as needed. You may have adequate forage and fall pasture depending on whether or not they're in lactation. But you probably will need to supplement protein in the fall because your later season pasture, it actually will have pretty good energy, but it's gonna be lower protein unless you, know, unless you have a lot of legumes in your pasture. And so again, any supplementing you're gonna be doing, you're doing it based on maintenance plus lactation or growth. So if you have a young doe, you're gonna, it'll be maintenance plus growth if she's never freshened. If you have a dough that's still in milk, you're gonna be maintenance plus lactation. And in some cases, lactation and growth in the case of a, a yearling. So late gestation, this is our most nutri important nutritional period. They're not able to eat as much feed because of the size of the feti. And so we're seeing a doe that doesn't have a whole lot of room to eat her feed because all of the, <clears throat> because of the kids are taking up most of the room in her, in her abdomen. 
And so a high quality feed is really essential in late gestation. But if you feed too much, again, you can end up with these high birth weight kids that cause kidding problems. And so you want her to be in a good body condition score, but you don't want her to be too high. But how, but her nutritional late gestation will affect her milk production. It'll affect the colostrum quality and how much colostrum, and it'll affect her overall health. And so when we look at weight gestation, again, we want that body condition score. And this says 2.5 to 3. I'd say, yeah, you don't want to be with a dairy goat. You probably don't want to be below a 3 going into late, late gestation. And you want to end 3 to 3.5. And, and I'd even go to a 4 in a, a yearling simply because she's going to be losing so much weight when she comes into lactation that she needs those extra reserves. But I wouldn't go above a 4. You don't want them thin because they're not going to have the reserves to go into that next lactation. You don't want them over conditioned because they're more likely to have metabolic problems at kidding. So again, pregnancy toxemia can be an issue. Ketosis can be an issue. Kidding problems, you know, dystocia can be a problem if they're over conditioned. Exercise can be really helpful with does in late gestation. So if they have, if if they can get out, even if it's a dry lot, get out and walk around, that's going to be a lot better for them than hanging out in the barn the whole time. And so at this point, you're going to be looking, depending on the size of the dough, anywhere from 0.15 to 0.3 pounds per day weight gains, what we want to see in a dough in late gestation, maybe even more if we're talking about a large sawn in dough. And again, this is going to depend on her body weight, her body condition score, and how many feet I are gestating. So a doe that's care a large sauna doe carrying triplets, you might even go more than that 0.3, you might even go to half a pound a day that she's gaining simply because she's putting in so many, you know, she's such a big doe and, and she has so many kids that she's raising or that she's gestating. And so again, she's not gonna have as much room and space in late gestation, particularly if she's gestating triplets. And a lot of times when we see problems is if we have an overweight or severely underweight doe that's gestating triplets tend to have, they're more likely to have pregnancy toxemia and they're more likely to have ketosis. And again, if you have a high moisture feed or a high roughage forage, they have to eat more to get the same number of calories. And so when lack of room and space is an issue, you may not want to feed your high roughage forages. And so you want to feed a little bit higher quality forage and something more digestible. And you definitely want to be feeding some concentrate to make sure they have enough energy. And so again, mineral nutrition is really important in late gestation. We want to make sure that they have both selenium and vitamin E. So it could be given via the mineral. And so you're going to use a mineral with the maximum amount allowed. Or it could be in a complete feed. You could feed it in via protein supplement or a premix. You can inject it via Bose or a combination of methods if you've had a history of selenium deficiency. And again, remember, selenium is potentially toxic, but selenium is vital to prevent white muscle disease. And so you want to make sure that that dough gets adequate selenium during that last part of pregnancy, late gestation. Calcium and phosphorus are essential for the skeletal formation of the kids, and you can have issues with hypocalcemia in the, the ewes or the does, or, or we're talking about does here. But as we're going into lactation, you know, they're, they need to pull that calcium out of their bones. And it's important that they, you know, that they are able to have enough calcium in their diet, but where they can support the calcium you know, requirements of going into lactation. Iodine is an important nutrient as well, and there are, Indiana overall is deficient in iodine, so it can be considered the goiter belt. So make sure whatever mineral you're feeding has iodine included. And then zinc, magnesium, magnesium, and copper are important for goats as well. And so having a good quality loose mineral and feeding it at the daily recommended rate can be really important, particularly in late gestation. Because again, this is the time, this is going to be when there is a lot of stress on the stove's body. You may consider additives, but work with your veterinarian on this. 
especially with dairy goats, you don't necessarily want to be feeding something that might affect you know, your ability to use the milk. And so it's just really going to depend on your farm history. But if you do have a coccidia problem, Remincin is approved in goats. Decox is approved for sheep and your veterinarian could probably get it, you know, give you an extra label use for goats as well. But Remincin is something that you can use if you do, if you do know that you have a coccidia problem. And then they come into lactation. So lactation is a huge nutrient drain. You know, most of your does that are coming into lactation for about 90 days or so, they're going to be in a negative energy balance. So this is where they are putting out more energy in body maintenance and lactation than they're able to take in via their diet. And so as, as she moves into lactation, you want to increase the energy in her diet and make sure that you're feeding the highest quality hay and forages available to you. And if you want high lactation, you, know, you want protein. You know, protein is necessary to supplement or to maintain those high levels of lactation, particularly if you have a high producing sun or alpine doe. Now, I have heard producers talk about issues that they've had in maintaining condition on these does if they had too much protein and not enough energy. So you really need to pay into pay attention to both protein and energy. Now, one thing that's really interesting with ruminants like goats is that most of the protein that they are using is not actually the protein that you're feeding them. Most of the protein that they actually use is microbial protein. So what you're doing when you're feeding a goat is you're feeding her rumen microbes. And then those rumen microbes will pass on into the rest of the digestive tract. And so they're actually absorbing protein from those microbes. And so you can use, so ruminants, including goats, can use lower quality forms of protein than a monogastric like a, a pig, for instance. But so energy is necessary in order to maintain body condition. And so there are different forms of energy. Energy could be in the form of a starch. And so that's going to be something that's rapidly assimilated by the rumen microbes. And again, it's a high you know, a quick source of energy, a high source of energy. You do have to pay, pay attention to founder if you have a, a rapid change in the amount of energy in the diet. And then the other source of energy is through fat. And so with fat, we're looking at vegetable fats with goats. Goats can tolerate, you know, the research has shown up to 12% of their diet is fat. Personally, I feed a 6% fat diet to my goats, which is, which is a higher fat diet than what you're going to see in your average commercial ration. But when we're looking at balancing a ration, the nutritional requirements for any animal are not percentages. So when you look at a, a feed tag, it's going to give percentages of these different nutrients. Well, a goat doesn't need... 16% of protein. A goat needs a certain amount, you know, and that will differ based on the goat. And so you need to figure out the exact how many grams of protein she needs. And so you're going to use a nutrition calculator to figure that out and you use the percentage that's on the tag to figure out how much of this, if this feed is 16% protein, how much of this feed does she need in order to reach the number of grams of protein that she needs per day. And that's where the percentages come in. But you have to remember that her requirements are not a certain percentage of protein, it's a certain amount of protein, certain number of grams per, you know. And she can only eat so much total. And so you need to consider the quality of your feed to make sure that you're meeting her needs within the amount of feed that she can actually eat. And so again, as we talked about before, it's really important to, you know, to do chemical analysis on your forage to, make, to see what supplementation you need to do. And so the higher quality and the more digestible your forage is, the less supplementation you're gonna to need to meet the nutritional requirements of your goat at that stage. And so if you don't know what the nutritional goat needs of your goats are, you could contact a livestock nutritionist, maybe with a local co-op, or you could contact your extension educator and they can put you in touch with a nutritionist because your local extension educator for ag and natural resources should know some nutritionists in your area they could put you in contact with. And so even if your livestock nutritionist doesn't have experience with goats, 
they know how to balance a ration, they can look at a chart to see what the what the requirements are for dairy goats at that stage, at the production stage, and they can help you formulate a ration based on that. So what should you use for supplementing your forages? So the, your easiest option is going to be commercially available dairy goat feeds. There's some great options out there. I just list a couple that I've used at some point in the past. These are both great options. You can find at least one brand at most farm stores. They'll have at least one dairy goat feed available. What this is, is a balanced ration and it takes out the guesswork. This is a ration that will work for most dairy goats. It provides the minerals that they need and it's balanced for calcium and phosphorus. So you're not having to balance the rations yourselves. But now you do need to know what quality of forage you're feeding. So you know how much to feed based on the label. But the label is going to tell you approximately how much to feed you know, to meet the needs of your goats based off of how much they're producing. You know, commercially, they're both pelleted and textured feeds, depending on what your goats like better, what you prefer to feed. If you have goats that like to sort their feed, sometimes a pelleted ration works better. And so for somebody who's new to goats, I would recommend going with a commercially available feed. Unless you have a strong background in livestock nutrition, Commercially available feeds are probably your best bet. And you can always supplement commercially available feeds with things like sunflower seeds or beet pulp to add more energy. The other option is a custom feed ration. So the picture here is an example of the custom feed ration that I, that I have mixed. So this is something that I've developed and tweaked over the years and it works really well for my herd. And so there are a couple of different ways you can do this. In general, a custom feed ration is probably going to be cheaper than a commercially available feed, but it's harder to get it right. So unless you have a background in ruminant nutrition, it's going to take some work. You're going to have to do some research. The cheapest option is probably to buy the individual ingredients and mix it yourself. But there's some questions in there. Can you mix it evenly? So are you going to have an even ration or are they going to get a lot more of one thing and not as much of another? And again, if you have picky goats, are they going to pick out some things and not eat the rest? Do you have a source for all the ingredients you want to use? That could be another thing. It may be more difficult for somebody to source the ingredients if you're an individual. And again, do you know how to properly balance that ration? Can you make sure that you have the right ratio of calcium to phosphorus? Can you make sure there's enough protein and energy in that ration? And so it takes a much higher level of knowledge to be able to mix your own ration. Another option is to have a custom ration mix in a mill. And this depends on whether or not you even have a mill that will mix your smaller quantities. And so I'm really fortunate that I have a mill that will do that, but a lot of people do not have somebody that can do that for them. And another advantage of working with a mill is sometimes they do have somebody, you know, they have some knowledge about these rations and they, can, they may be able to help you with formulation. And so if they have that, that can be a big advantage of working with a mill. And they can help balance, or if you tell them, I want 6% of this to be, you know, to be fat, and I want to use this as my sort of fat, then they can, they can do the calculations for you. And so that kind of takes out having to do all the calculations yourself. And so you could say, I want these ingredients, and, and I want them to be these percentages of the ration, or I want it then they, a mill could help you do that, depending on the mill. But again, you do have to have some knowledge of how to balance a ration and some knowledge of the ingredients if you're going to do anything with a custom ration. And so unless you have taken a college course in ration balancing or in ruminant nutrition, I don't advise you creating your own ration unless you have a nutritionist help you or unless you've just done a whole lot of research yourself. And so if you're going to do that, you do need to understand your feed ingredients. And this is just scratching the surface of our feed ingredients. But in general, our grains like corn and wheat and barley are going to be high in energy and high in phosphorus. Your legumes like soybeans and alfalfa and our other legumes are typically going to be high in protein. And some of them are also going to be high in calcium. We also have byproducts, and these could be byproducts of of harvest, like soybean hulls, which is a great byproduct to use. 
It's easily digestible fiber. So it's a source of energy and a source of fiber because it's highly digestible. It could be you know, from manufacturing, beet pulp is a byproduct, you know, corn gluten is a byproduct. So there are a number of different byproducts out there. And they'll all have different nutritional pro you know, profiles based on what they're a byproduct of. And so some will be sources of energy, some will be sources of protein, or many other things. And then minerals. So ideally you wanna use a, a mineral that's formulated for goats and you can mix it in with your feed or you can feed it separately. But again, unless you are an expert on the mineral requirements of goats, you're best off using a pre-formulated mineral mix for goats. And so for more information, you know, we have a Purdue Forage Field Guide that'll help you understand a lot more about forages. The e-extension page has a lot of different information about goats. Yeah, ADGA has a, a publication about body condition scoring goats, and they also have that 20 minute YouTube video that is excellent. And then, you know, Langston has the Dairy Goat Nutrition Calculator. And so these are all resources that I would recommend using. So we have about three minutes. So if we have any questions, I will take questions now. So do we have any questions? No, the room's quiet. Okay. Any questions for Sarah? I know everybody's got their nutrition calculators out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a you know, we just barely touched the surface, barely scratched the surface, but this is such a big topic. I mean, it really takes several college classes to really understand nutrition. Okay. Looks like a quiet group, Sarah. Okay. Thank you very much. What's the best way to work with, uh, with your extension educator in a county? if you're in your local counties. Okay, so in your local counties, you know, just look up the local extension office and introduce yourself, just call and ask for the Educator for Ag and Natural Resources. Not all counties have one, but they do, but all counties will have an educator. And so if you have questions, you know, just, just ask them your questions. And if they don't know the answer, they will reach out to the other educators around the state and get your answer for you. And so even if they don't have the answers themselves, they have the resources to find the answers. Great. I know uh, locally we've got a hay probe available that we can borrow in our extension office to, and they can connect us with where to send that kind of thing. So they've been a good resource on that. Right, and most of our county offices do have a hay probe available and they should be able to connect you with those resources. Okay. And if your county office doesn't, you probably have a neighboring county office that does. And so they could probably check with their neighboring counties to see which ones have hay probes available. All right. Last call for questions for Sarah. Okay. Thanks so much. It looks like the, the group has gotten, uh, gotten great information and uh, we appreciate your time and energy. Uh, you are recording this, so we're gonna- Yes, I will, I'll upload it to YouTube tomorrow for you. Great. I'll share with the Indiana Dairy Goats yeah, group tomorrow. Um, access to your slides, will that just be part of the YouTube or do you have a slide deck available separately? I can I could provide that slide deck available separately. I can email it. Okay. Great. I'll send you I'll send you an email address for that. <laughs>